clicking the subscribe button. Doctors, have a great show. Thanks, Annette. Thank you so much. Man. I thought we thought the whole show was going to be taken up by that introduction of telling about myself. <laughs> it was down the show. You spent the whole show telling about myself. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen, when you've done as much as you've done, then I think at that point you deserve to be spoken about. And uh, I know Eric was having a little bit of uh, audio difficulties while he gets that figured out. Oh, you're back on. That's cool. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I'm a, I'm just going to stop start and I know Eric you're going to probably do the same thing and then we'll kind of dive into really what those who tuning in really want to hear about, but you know you've been impactful to generations of individuals. And and so I think Eric and myself, we are not excluded from the group of individuals who've been impacted by your work and the foundation that you've laid. You know, I I I remember before I even thought about the power of nutrition. I remember my sister handed me your book of Eat to Live and said, you have to read this book. And I said, oh, no, I'm not, reading, I'm not reading that book. I have books I'm reading already. What are you talking about? And I will tell you, when I jumped into it, and I'm not going to spend much time, but when I finally dis knew that this was the avenue to go and what I needed to do in part of my career and my journey and my treatment of patients, all I did was simply give someone your book and the changes started happening. I didn't have an elevator pitch. I didn't have all the words and trying to craft and the knowledge and so forth. But I handed them your book and the changes that ensued were just powerful. So once again, thank you for the lives you've changed directly and indirectly. And I think that's where the power lies. Thank you so much. And I, I would just piggyback. There's two, two things. One, I, the first book I think I read was the China study, but it wasn't very instructional. It was very frightening in a sense <laughs> when I first read it as a physician um, working at a health department at the time. And the second one I read um, was Eat to Live. And that was transformative, honestly. And it, I, I think to Columbus's point, made me like an evangelist for the cause of whole food, plant-based living. Um, one of the phrases you, you gave that really made it crystallize in the book is nutritarian. And I'd never thought of it that way, that really, it, you know, we should be eating to get as much nutrients out of the food. It's literally, that's the purpose of food. Um, and so that was very helpful um, when I looked at that. And I, and I think even to this day, it's one of the, you know, one of the big reasons that I followed down this path. Um, the other book that you wrote was um, Fast Food Genocide. And it, it, was, it was different. I'm not, you're the only one of the authors in this space that really wrote a book that spoke to health disparities, why we have the health disparities, and how some of the social issues around race have played into that in socioeconomics. And so I thank you for that. I think it's transformational. I teach at the university level as well as still practicing and being an administrator. Um, and I, I reference your books all the time. And I try and get the younger generation to read your books uh, because um, they're not getting this information. And I'm dealing with doctorates in nursing and in public health and those kinds of fields. And many of them have never heard um, the benefits of, of a whole food plant-based diet. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for that. And it's quite um, you know, touching to have the fact that you've read even my, so many of my books and that you've even read Fast Food Genocide. That's great because it's, it's one of the books that's dearest to my heart and it's the one that did not become a New York Times bestseller. You know what I mean? It's not like the end of diabetes, the end of heart disease, the end of, the end of dieting. Those books sell better. But Fast Food Genocide is like a must read. And it's not oh, yeah. a bestseller, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, and, and part of that is, you know, you, you wonder somewhat about timing and everything else like that, because the information is so powerful, but it is targeted towards it. And it's meant for everyone. Right. So the information right. that's contained in there is something that applies to everyone, but it's wrapped and draped inside of a package that really addresses, as Eric mentioned, those who are overrepresented in terms of disease burden and perhaps underrepresented in other areas of, of, of prominence. And so, you know, I agree, bravo for that, but the information is powerful. So we're, we're, we, that's what we've been about is taking information from your book and independent research and really trying to spread the message and the, main, the work that's been laid out by many uh, on, on, from a public health standpoint. Right. And getting to the core of the issue here, I'm making these radical claims and I'm saying that junk food, commercial baked goods and fast food are like being addicted to drugs. They're like eating, they're like consuming drugs and they hook people. 
and they take over their lives. They destroy their health. They change their personalities and they make their life headed for medical tragedies. Yeah. And until the population recognizes that, that they can really commit suicide with food and not just, not just die young, but impair the quality of their life, their most their entire life, affect the way they think, how they do in school, how they go after their career, how they deal with others, how they interact with their spouses and family and friends and people they love. And, the, and food addiction is a, is a core issue that can change a person's life for the worst, for the worse. And, um, you know, and, and people don't recognize that. Like they recognize it with alcohol. They recognize it with smoking. They know that food can make a person diabetic or can make you have heart disease or raise your blood pressure, but they don't see how food affects mental function, affects personality, drives behavior, and can destroy your life in so many ways, creating a population that's addicted to um, highly palatable commercial bakers and fast food so that people are actually universally dysthymic. You know what I mean? They're, they're, mm -hmm. The relationship, of course, between commercial bakers and fast food and depression is a solid relationship, dose-dependent relationship. But even people don't become depressed. It still affects their outlook, their passions, their ability to be happy and thrilled about and excited about life and the natural world and their ability to emote and care for other people are all hindered by this addictive their relationship they have with self-destructive substances. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And, and that, I... I Go ahead, Columbus. Go ahead. No, no, please. Well, I was going to say one of the quotes um, just really set the stage. We, you, we, you know, I, I use this quote from from your book uh, because I think it's one of the most powerful statements. In fact, I would argue it is the most powerful statement on the issue of nutrition and, and how we eat in America. And I'm going to read it because uh, we, I've read it so many times that I'd, I'd love to hear you talk more about it. It's the statement from Eat to Live where it says the modern food and drug industry has converted a significant portion of the world's people to a new religion, a massive cult of pleasure seekers who consume coffee, cigarettes, soft drinks, candy, chocolate, alcohol, processed foods, fast foods, and concentrated dairy fat, cheese, in a self-indulgent orgy of destructive behavior. When the inevitable results of such bad habits appear, pain, suffering, sickness, and disease, the addicted cult members drag themselves to physicians and demand drugs to alleviate their pain, mask their symptoms, and cure their diseases. These revelers become so drunk on their addictive behavior and the accompanying addictive thinking that they can no longer tell the difference between health and health care. One of the most powerful statements outside of probably the holy scriptures of the world on this issue. It is that poignant, and it is so true. And I tell people, during this COVID, we were talking before we went on air about how so many people don't believe in COVID. They don't believe in the vaccine. They don't believe in all these things. Um, and so they're mad at the pharmaceutical companies as if the pharmaceutical companies are the devil. And I've been telling people, the truth is, there are no pharmaceutical companies without the food industry. If you had went back to eating whole food, plant-based living like people did 500 years ago, with the, with the hygiene we have today and the vaccination programs and things we have today we didn't have, you would need all of the drugs that we have. They're literally being produced to combat what food is doing. Right. And I, of course, you know, you know that I'm, you know, that rebel radical, but I, you know, I see so much of what doctors and their relationship with the pharmaceutical industry has done is encouraged, been enablers of people's food addiction, because they think that here they can give a drug for their diabetes, give a drug for their blood pressure, give a drug for their cholesterol, give a drug for everything that ails them. And, it, and that makes the, gives the psychological and intellectual message that you can still live with your self-abusive behaviors and just take a drug and it's going to make yes. you okay. So it makes it people think that, oh, I, my blood, I don't have a blood pressure problem. My blood pressure is normal on the drugs I'm mm -hmm. taking. And they keep eating the same diet that caused the problem to begin with. And they don't recognize that the pathology continues to advance while the blood pressure registers normal. They yeah, exactly. The damage to the interior wall, the blood vessel, the atherosclerosis, the loss of elasticity, they're on their way, that trajectory to a heart attack or a stroke, but now they're not aware of it because the med blood pressure medications make them look okay. All the mm -hmm. doctor did was give them the permission to continue to self-abuse themselves. We've never had a drug that person would have to cut the salt out and exercise and start eating vegetables and cut out the 
all the saturated fats and they'd start, you know, they'd have to make lifestyle changes that would be significant enough to get lower their blood pressure glucose. Now they don't have to make those, those changes. They can just take a pill. Yeah. No, and, and, that, and that, I just, just two things. One is the statement that Eric just read. I'm going to tell you, that is a straight East Coast hard statement that's like hard hitting right so that, that, that's the, that's that new york coming out i can feel that yes <laughs> it's, 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 did you get that from that that's from eat to live that's me to live okay yeah that that right there is some good stuff i, I love read that, that to pay i read that to patients i read that yes. to patients I, and, and i work in urgent care i'm not in primary care I, i'm family medicine trained like you are and did a uh -huh. preventive medicine residence but i read that statement because I think people don't get that those connections. Sorry, go ahead, Columbus. Yeah, yeah no, 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 no. This, I mean, that that's the thing. I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that because I think that's the beauty of the way in which you've written your books is that your personality comes out in full, and so you, we feel the passion and the care and the concern. And and that's one of the things I'm curious about is just you're seeing now. You've been in this business this space for so long. Seven. New York Times bestselling books to transform lives. And now the world seems to be more receptive to it. Whether or not they've embraced it fully, they're more receptive. Whereas before you were like yeah. this fringe guy, you're yeah. out there talking, saying like, oh, what's he talking about? Now you're, it's like, yes. You know, and how does that make you feel to kind of see the, the evolution and, and the seeds that you were a part of and laying the foundation? How does that make you feel? Definitely makes me, certainly makes me feel that, um, you know, well rewarded emotionally and what I, about all the hard work and the, you know, extra time and the research and all the work put into that was certainly worth it. And I feel that I've made a large impact. It's very, very um, gratifying. Definitely. Okay. Mm, wonderful. Wonderful. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I, I, an analogy kind of came to my mind as you were talking really about this burdensome of disease. And I see it on a regular basis. You know, people say, hey, doc, I'm on my statin. I'm on my beta blocker. I'm on my ACE inhibitor. You know, I don't know why I had another heart attack. And it's because we didn't take care of the root cause. And, and you have this image that becomes distinctive of you think of like an apple tree. And I know you have an orchard inside your, your, your yard. We'll have to get touched about that, touch base with that a bit later on. But imagine like if all the apples were rotted. And so someone decides they're going to go and put plastic apples up there to make it have the appearance as if everything is OK. And it's not. It's a marker of a, of a root problem, a problem that's there in the root of the tree that's there in the soil and underneath that has to be addressed if you're really going to correct and really produce the fruit that mm -hmm. you're desiring. And so we cover up and we're curious, well, why is it the fact that people are still having heart attacks across America and their cholesterol levels are perhaps lower on these statins and they're still having an issue. Why yes. is it now that we're finding new markers, whether or not it's ABOB B or if it's, or if it's, if it's low dense LDL or if it's C-reactive protein or if whatever the imaging to try and detect, why is it that we're still seeing um, these, these occurrences happen? And so I think there's so much power in, in, in what you do, what Eric and I try and do in terms of ministering really to patients on a personal level, to let them know that there's, it's more important. There's a bigger picture at, at stake in terms of their future. So, I wanted to acknowledge that. Yes, definitely. And of course, I, I want to ask you. I the, want to, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm saying it puts the power back in the hands of the individual. Absolutely. So that they yes. can now take care of themselves, but also reach out and be a role model for other people. And so, instead of just taking a drug, they're actually actively in control of their health destiny. And one thing about human emotional health is when you're in control and not feel helpless, you're much, you're living a much more happier life mm -hmm. and living with fear of disease. It also gives you confidence because you know that you are living a healthful life and now you don't have to be fearful of being, you know, dying, running for a bus or, you know, you're not, mm -hmm. and you're, so, you, so it gives you a happier life, but a life without living in fear. Chron chronic fear is not good for a person's health anyway. And when you eat a conventional diet, and you're going to doctors and taking drugs and you're always sick and all, and then you're always living in chronic fear as well. You know? Yes. What, what I, I wanted to um, ask a bit about that actually. Stress is one of the things we talk about a lot. The right. need for, for um, to lower stress um, and for resilience. Um, I, one of the things I really enjoyed about fast food genocide, and I'm shocked that it was not one of your seven New York Times bestselling books. I, even though I guess when I think about some of the content, it probably would make some mm -hmm. people uncomfortable, honestly, uh, mm -hmm. because it is such a profound book. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about stress. We talk a lot about the stress that comes to 
uh, minority groups, people of color in this country, um, just inherently. And then you add to that, that disproportionately in our neighborhoods are fast food restaurants, bodegas and corner stores that don't have, necessarily have nutritional foods. We call them soups, food, deserts and so forth. Um, how, you know, what, how do we, you know, address that a little bit, talk a little bit. Um, many of the folk may not have, have read that book. Uh, talk a little bit about how you came into writing that book. And, and um, you know, for us, it's so significant. Why is it significant to you? Why did you think that one was an important one to write? Yes, definitely, definitely important. You know, it seems that when I wrote Eat to Live, I come across a lot of research that doesn't fit that book. And then it's better to have another book it fits. So then I wrote Disease Proof Your Child because I re read all this research that I didn't put into Eat to Live that describes how what you eat in your childhood impacts your later life risk of cancer even. It's not just so there's a, there's a tremendous lag time between cause and effect with regard to cancer. And I wanted to let people know that how you feed your child can impact their whole life, whether they get an autoimmune disease in the age of 30, or whether they get breast cancer at 50 is, can be largely impacted by the diet they ate in the first 10 years of life, let's say. So I put that, and I thought that would be fascinating information, but of course, that book never became a bestseller either. Mm. It's, so it's not, but in any case, but then you're saying this, so then in my um, researching about you know, food addiction, the end of dieting, and all my research I'm putting together, and I'm studying, you know, I'm trying to review 20,000 scientific research articles that are going to pick the 2,000 or 3,000 I'm going to utilize to support the, the book itself. And I realized, well, this is really information that has to be another book. There's so much information here about history, about how food dictates behavior, and how we've went down the, the path of, and how science and behavior interacts that we aren't just the result of our genetics. We're the result of what food we put into our body and exactly. food affects the genes and food changes genes. And we are, it's not our genes direct what we eat. It's what we eat directs what our genes become and what we eat affect, can affect future generations. Not only do what we eat as a childhood can affect our later life health, but what our parents eat could affect the health of your offspring as well. And we're in control and food choices make such a huge difference. And so that, so I wanted to put that book together because I found the information fascinating and interesting and I'm writing to benefit the public, but I'm also writing because I find the information interesting and feel it should be known by, by other people too, you know? Yeah. That book, that book resonated because there's a, there's a, there's a verse that says, uh, the sins of the father visit the children to the third and the fourth generation. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, from a, from a medical kind of scientific standpoint, literally that happens with diet, right? I mean, one generation eats, epigenetics comes into play, and you can pass down a gene to a child that they'd never supposed to get in the first place uh, because of what happened. And especially during the maternal period, um, when cortisol releasing hormone can cross at the placenta barrier, go in and affect that child, actually have them lay down more adipose cells in utero, the child actually now has more fat cells than they would have had if the mother was not stressed and the mother was eating well. So uh, those connections are critical um, and ties to the next piece of it. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was saying exactly. And if you, I felt if people have this information that not only will they make better choices, but maybe we can all work together as a society to learn how to help each other and protect each other and make for a healthier population, caring for each other and not shove people down the wrong, push people in an uncomfortable and unhealthy position, and then blame them when we forced them there and pushed them there yeah. and tortured them or treated them unfairly, and we're going to blame them for the bad outcome that comes from their bad health because we caused them to have no food and bad health. It's, it's like it's, so in other words, instead of, so let's, how about all helping each other and working together so we have excellent food out access, healthy food for all, which is a, you know, if, if a person doesn't at least have the right to have um, healthy, life-sustaining food, then how is there any degree of equality or humanitarianism Absolutely. or care for other people? If we're not going to even give them the basics, the basic needs of having food and air and clean water, you know what I mean? That's the, yeah. um... Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that is, I mean, that right there is the key, is when we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it's life, life pursuit of health 
and wellness. Mm -hmm. And so when we have communities, and this is all communities, this is pervasive, um, who are subjugated towards an environment. And one says, well, what's the impact of free will? And I think that's the key is what you bring out and what others have in terms of this level of addiction and that it's multi-layered from us, not only from a standpoint of advertisement, not only from a standpoint of what's inside the schools, without even touching based on the schools or the hospitals that then are on the receiving end on the back end, but also in terms of just really looking at the burden of the addictiveness of the construct of the food. You know, we've had Michael Moss on from uh, 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 Sugar, Salt and Fat and, and his book that really kind of investigates and kind of furthers along some of the data in which that you spoke about and how these manufacturers just really dig into it and they start tying in and creating this, this bliss point. They create this idea of, of food that now, when you say addiction, going back and doing something when you know it's causing you harm, it is addiction. It's an addiction. Yeah, yeah why sure. would people be, you know, I, it's a broad definition and people can argue, but um, why do people behave in a self-destructive fashion? Why shouldn't a person behave in their own best interest for their own health and happiness? And almost nobody does that because addiction is so universal in our society that they sit seen as being perfectly normal. And the abnormal person is the person who's not who's eating for good health. We're the we're you know, and which is totally backwards yeah. because obviously um, it's so prevalent that it, now the addictive behaviors are seen to be more socially acceptable as normal. And if you're not a food addict, then you're not going to be or, or an alcoholic, or or if you don't drink alcohol or eat unhealthy foods, you're seen as being a social pariah. I think one of the reasons the quote I read I love so much, and when I even in my classes, I was teaching a um um a public health nurse, a doctor of nursing class this summer. And I, and I showed this quote and I said, one of the things that happens is that you notice politicians on either side never talk about health. They talk about health care. They talk about health systems. They talk about insurance. They talk about covering people, but they don't actually talk about what would make the American people healthier. And I think part of the reason they do that is because many of them know what it would really take to move the needle in that direction. And it would be to stop um, taking tax dollars and uh, subsidizing industries that actually create disease. It would mean you have to change what the government recommends people eat. You'd have to change the lunches in schools. Um, you'd have to, I mean, I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, so many things would have to change that big lobbyists and big industry have, have contributed to. Um, so they don't talk about health. They talk about health care and health insurance because there's money in health care and health insurance, but there's not in health. In true health, if everyone is healthy, there really is no money, except there's no cost to society. So society ultimately is a better fair market society because imagine if every child in America was fully healthy, went to PE class and picked a sport, how much better would we do in the Olympics if every child was fully healthy when they, when they went through PE in grade school, found gymnastics, found basketball, found whatever, and they were the best they could possibly be? We would compete better. We'd produce better as a nation. And they'd be so intellectually and emotionally stable as well to pursue whatever their dreams may be. Absolutely. Yes. Beyond sports. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. Let's talk yes. a little bit about that. You're the also one of the few authors. And again, I read, you know, Columbus and I share books. We read books like crazy. A lot of them now we do on Audible because we're so busy. And we do it because we drive long distances. Um, right. But I will say you're one of the few authors that actually addresses the impact of food on um, not just mental health, but on personality, intellect, behavior. I've, I, I really have been impressed with what, what, what you've written on that. And I'd love for you to speak a little bit to that. Right. It's a, yes, I'm saying right now that there is a parallel between drug addiction and food addiction. The same areas the brains are lit up, the, you know, and you, you get dopamine insensitive and you get developed cravings and you want, want more brain stimulation. And when you, when you start to be dependent on brain stimulation, then your body behaves in a way that that becomes a high degree of importance in your life and your choices you make. So now that your desire for this instantaneous gratification becomes an overwhelming driver of your behavior, hmm. that's making a person more narcissistic. When you're a oh, drug addict, you could cheat, steal, lie, wow. hurt other people just to get your fix. But people don't see there's a relationship with food addiction, maybe not as severe. But when you're going, when you're a food addict, 
you're not really concerned when you're an addict in general, your primitive brain is making your decisions, not your cerebral brain. And these decisions involved in self-destructive behavior also make you less caring and feeling for the external world and less involved with the world where your fingertips end. It makes you more involved with your own immediate gratification and to some degree, narcissistic tendencies. And I'm saying right now that, um, that there's a different way you can go after pleasure in life. One way of going after pleasure is trying to feel better than other people, superior to them, knock them down, have contempt for them, make you believe you're a big shot, wear the fanciest clothing, have the fanciest car, try to make yourself better than thinking you're better than other people, have what, whatever drives that behavior. And I'm saying that people are going after the approval of other people, and that's not the core way to be truly happy. It's a very super fresh way. It's like taking a drug. The real way to be happy is to be able to care and feel for the outside world, love reality, enjoy the passions of, and, and feel and care for other people and relate to them and care about them and want the best for them. And your, your ability to emote and care for other people and appreciate and have gratitude for the beauty of the natural world goes hand in hand. And that's weakened the more you're an addict. The more you're an mm -hmm. addict, you're less caring for other people. It's more just about meeting your need for your addictive substance. And, you, and because these substances also make, make you um, lose brain function and increase your feeling of dysthymia and depression, you also are becoming more like, so you, you're working a job to make money, but then your outlet for pleasure is just imbibing in addictive substances and you have no other outlooks for pleasure, which involves interacting and having passion for your day and your life. So you have less passion about living. You're not motivated to, to leave a message and to relate to other people. I'm, pardon me, I'm my dog. Is, can you hear my dog barking in the background? I'm not <laughs> Perfectly fine. Don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah. We know the power of dogs in terms of uh, health and well-being. So that's perfect. Okay. All right. I was going to have had to stop and put him outside or something, but it's not <laughs> bothering too much. Okay. So what I'm saying is there's a lot going on here, the way food affects mental function, because... Even people that don't get depressed from eating poorly, they're still having some negativity on their outlook of life. And they're still losing their passion and excitement about life. And then the more they're driven to, go, to, be, to be attracted to and unable to resist and going after the craving of these foods, which affects their emotions, also makes them narrowly consumed with the, inst with the immediate future, the immediate time of now of feeling good and not what's best for their future or the future of humanity or other people or the planet. They have less passion about doing good for humanity. They don't become the full person they could have become. They're a mere fraction of their own human potential, both physically, emotionally, and then it affects their behavior. And they're more easily angered, more easily irritable. And of course, um, we, you know, I gave that example of pellagra, you know, from the, from the late 1800s when people had not niacin deficiency in the, in the South and people were becoming more violent and suicidal and homicidal and aggressive, part of the, you know, and lynchings and attacks and all this stuff was promoted by, of course, an inherent superiority and contempt and the worst part of human nature, but also by poor nutrition, which makes people more easily angered and less peaceful. And I'm saying it's happening today. We can see that poor nutrition affects the brain in a negative way and makes people less able to be a long-term thinker of what's best for their long-term benefit and others around them and less caring and feeling. And I'm worried about this. I'm worried about the fact that our political structure of our country and the way people think is now more um, short-term thinking, narcissistic thinking, more ability to be affected by nonsensical and, you know, and, mm. and, and crazy thinking because their diets have may affected their brain and more predisposed them to believing all types of crazy nonsense without the ability to, to think logically and weigh evidence. You know what Very I mean? Very true. And, and here's the thing, without that ability, you, don't, you no longer have a true democracy. Yeah. So if people, uh, and I think, I don't, I don't remember if it was Thomas, uh, if it was Edison or Jefferson, but one of them said, you know, without true education, meaning the ability to critically think, you don't have a democracy. Because if people can just be led by any spurious belief, you know, 
you, you can have people vote against their own best interests even. And um, I think we're seeing that. One other thing I, I, in, in one of your books I read about that I thought was interesting was the effect of food on the, on the gut microbiome and how that actually does affect the brain as well. Um, yes. So it's a very tangible scientific, you can connect the dots as to how um, food actually really does affect the brain, thinking, clarity, decision making. And I, I, I like what you just said. In a sense, it's frightening for society. Because if you, if this, you know, this change, I mean, I, one of your books, you talk about when this change happened, it was like the 40s and 50s, that the food industry, that the food, the world of food in this country really transformed pretty radically into a very processed, commercialized way of producing food. Um, and we've stuck to that. Everything from the TV dinner to, you know, fast food restaurants have really stuck with us since then, except they've proliferated and their largest share of what people consume now. Yes, exactly. Um, and we've got it, and it's this is um, exciting to have some um, relationships with people who see this, and we're working to turn it around. You know, um, it's a you know a, a something I always hope for to have people who would be taking this burden on and trying to spread this word to have, to have this information be known that it's not just about that's a lot of that. Food plays a huge role in how we think and how we're going to protect the future of, the, of humanity and this country and people. And our, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, no, just jumping in real briefly. I mean, you know, <clears throat> there are two things that really struck me over the past several months. So there was an, a study that came out of Journal of American College of Cardiology that looked at projections going forward in the future and saying and showing that pe persons of color, people of color, were more likely to, to die and have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, while other populations were, were decreasing uh, in terms of the occurrence of this disease. But overall, the burden is shifting upwards. And this was preceded a, say, a subsequent study that was done out of the VA, the veteran study, and looking at the nutritional profile and showing that those individuals who ate a high quality plant-rich food diet, that they were less likely to die of having cancer, of having mm -hmm. diabetes, of having all the ailments that we know. So we know that it's not race dependent. We know that race is a social construct. We know that what's good for the goose is good for the gander, that if we provide folks with the food that can nourish and enrich them and break the cycle of addiction, that there's power inside of that. So what I want, my question for you is, what can we tell those who are tuning in or who are going to subsequently tune in how to break this cycle of addiction. Yes. How you break this cycle of addiction for those who are still struggling. They hear you. They have the knowledge. They've read the book, but somehow they can't seem to implement it on a consistent basis. I, I think that with, when you're breaking any addiction, there's some difficulty with discomfort, both physically and emotionally in the mm -hmm. short run. And I think the way they get to break it is to recognize the physical discomfort from giving up addictive substances goes away pretty fast in a few weeks. And then there is some emotional overtones here that take a while to really love the new way of eating. And, but, but the major thing that drives people too, is they feel that they are not just luck and they have control of their health destiny now, and they can achieve excellent health if they have that ch make the right choices, but also that they become a superhero, a role model. They can re once they become an example of good health and have gotten off their and, and gone on to healthy living and healthy eating, no matter where they are in a walk in their walk of life, they still can be become a role model to positively affect other people. And that brings them a, another degree of personal satisfaction and reward. So the reward you get from achieving good health is not only your own feeling good, but you have the ability to be respected and impact other people. And this is the way society can change for the better by people first putting the oxygen mask on themselves first, improving their own health, and then they can act as a role model for other people. And until they're putting that oxygen mask and take better care of their own health, they can't have a good effect on other people or even um, showing people care and love and the mm -hmm. feeling of, so people won't listen to you unless they, you feel that you care about them. Mm -hmm. And the ability to care about others is affected by your own personal emotional health. And the ability to be driven that way. So I think the it's it's a stepping stone. But a person takes the initiative and then they have to be dedicated to it enough so they can achieve the the bliss point of 
like the, they're saying the bliss point of bad food, but the bliss point <laughs> of eating right is when you start to your taste buds change, your taste muscles have modified. You learn to prefer this way of eating. You're proud of what you're doing. You're feeling good about yourself and you're feeling good that you can have a role, that you're a role model and can show care for other people in a positive way. So I think that if people knew all the benefits they would glean from, for their own lives, their own personal lives, I think people would take the ability to abstain from these addictive substances that are taking them down. And you can't get rid of an addiction unless you're willing to abstain from these harmful substances. And of course, as you know, my, the central core of my work is that it's impossible to get rid of a food addiction and even diet and get healthy unless you start to put nutrients into your body. Exactly. And the starting point, because it's too difficult, you can't control your ravenous appetite. You can't control the cravings. Your biology mm -hmm. is too strong opposing that. So until you start to eat vegetables and beans and nuts and, and onions and mushrooms, when you start putting a lot of good food in the body, you start to feel better and you start to give your body the possibility of changing. So the first step is to start to eat, he eat healthy and put these phytochemicals and antioxidants and nutrients the body is starving for. You can't even convert carbohydrate into energy efficiently without cofactors, vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals to diffuse the oxidation, the, rea the reactive oxygen species that are produced. So you can't even, you're generally lethargic, both physically and emotionally and when you're eating poorly. You can't mm -hmm. take action and get anything done in your life. You're, you know, because you're, so until you start to fuel your body with nutrients, you're just a mere fragment of, of who you could be. Wow, That's right. very profound. Yes, yes, yes. Reminds me of a car. I haven't watched cartoons in, in a long time. Trust me. Okay. For those, if I have any patients who are watching, I spend more time reading than I do watching TV. But, you know, I remember <laughs> they would, have, they would do these images and they would show like a superhero who's somehow that the evil guy gets them and they get all grayed out and they look a shell of themselves. And that's almost like what you're describing is that somehow we lose our true form of who we're supposed to be and what we can be. And it, it, it reminds me, we all have a thousand stories, but I think the one I just kind of spoke with someone here recently and suffering with blood pressure that was in the 200s and small strokes and diabetes through the roof. And literally it's been maybe two weeks. Blood sugar is down, dropping low. Blood pressure is low, coming off the medications and just, they're so just invigorated. And so- <clears throat> There's a wonderful quote by Alexander Chase, an author, and he says, he says, a shocking occurrence ceases to become shocking when it occurs daily. And so I, I, I tell that quote, all, I say that quote all the time to my patients and I say, but the key is it still can bring a, a smile. And so it's no longer shocking, but it still brings a smile to my face, the oh, power wow. of lifestyle, the power of nutrition and the yes. work that's been laid by individuals like yourself. So, and then so there's, a, there's a beauty here. There's yes. a beauty in the fact that um, it's unfortunate people have to get sick, but at least yes. there's an answer that we found that can give people back, put them back in control again. And if they want to give themselves a much better life. So even though people, some people are angry that we're saying people are responsible or partially responsible for their own high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, you know, they're not, they didn't know about it. They didn't do it on purpose. They didn't know this way, way, the way the American society lives. But still, there's a different way they could live. If they learn about it, they have an option here to have a better life and a better life for their family and their children. Now, one of the things I would love for you to talk a little bit about are the retreats you do. I've been, I've been, I've been, I've wished I could go on one of these for years. Um, and every time I look on, on your, on your site, I've, I've been a, I think I was a gold member. I buy I bought, buy your um, salad dressings and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Delicious, oh, wow. great stuff, great products, um, and better than what you get again. A lot of the health food stores because it's whole food, which is what I tell people. One of the reasons these products are so good is that they're they're whole food. This isn't this isn't some con, you know it's vegan, but it's not healthy. It, it's actual whole food. Um, so uh, talk a little bit about what you do at these retreats, um, why it is that you, you, you have ventured into the world, a very, I mean, it's, it's very difficult world of, of selling, you know, whole food products. Um, uh, give, give us a little background about it and what happens at these retreats. Sure. Um, well, you know, for many years, maybe, you know, more than 10, 15 years, I've kind of run summer vacations, you know, getaways and taking people on healthy vacations to different parts of the United States and even sometimes international 
where people who want to live healthy and eat healthfully can learn, get educated, and join us in having fun and in a learning and in a healthy learning and eating environment. And then over the years, so I've still done it with COVID. We've you know done a lot, had to stop some of that for a while, and we do have another trip coming up this October. Um, but um, that's just a small part of one of the things I kind of enjoyed doing and a service that I enjoyed, um, you know, having lots of people come and be able to lecture myself, lecturing and other people, a few other people lecturing and us having fun together, you know, but the, but then I, my career, you know, the frust, the little bit of frustration, or I could say is that so many people have learned about healthy eating, but don't seem to be able to apply it in a way to make it work for them. They've learned about it, but there's, their addictions are so significant that they just really can't put it into action in their home environment. So I had this dream of setting up a center in, you know, wherever that would be, but I wanted a center where people come and stay a few months, like a, like a person goes with cocaine addiction and mm-hmm. stay there for two to three months, like a cocaine addict can, and learn how to, and, and help them develop a new life and a new way of thinking about food and change their taste muscle and teach them the recipes and make them enjoy that and have them stay away from their love affair and their addictive triggers that they can't keep mm. um, keep imbibing in. Because obviously, when you keep eating things that are bad for you, it keeps your desire to keep wanting them. You can't stop mm-hmm. the desire for smoking unless you get off the cigarettes and you can't stop alcohol unless you stay away from it. You have some and it just causes people to binge. The same thing with food. So I started the center in California here, the, um, a retreat center where people come and they don't, the minimum stay is 30 days, by the way, but most mm-hmm. people stay longer than that. Most people stay two months or even three months. And they, and it changes their life forever because they invest this time and it really enables people who were unable to do this on their own to be able to leave here and replicate it and continue with the process when they leave. So we have many people that lost 50 to 100 pounds. And then but when we follow them up, they're continuing to lose weight when they go home. Because my concern was that when people go away to a retreat for a week, and we used, we used to run one-week retreats for Whole Foods Market, where they would take their most overweight and sickly employees and put them in a hotel with us for a week so we could teach them how to, reduce, how to get healthy again and reduce health care costs. And we found that most of the people that – were so revved up and excited and enthusiastic and learned from what they learned over this week, when they went back to their home environments, they didn't do it. They went back to their old way of eating. And we discovered the reasons, we, we researched it more, the reason was always the social influence of peers and family and friends and workers that they felt too unusual or too different in their home environments eating this way. So we realized that people have to change the way they think about going after self-esteem, which is coming from not from pleasing other people, but from feeling you're having goodwill towards them. That's a different way of going after self-esteem. But so the answer to your question is we have, I have this eat to live retreat here in San Diego that's open all year round and people stay a month or two and it really affords people the opportunity to make a complete change in their life if they couldn't do it on their own. You know, certainly people can read books, they can start, they can help doctors, they can read, they can watch videos. And most people do su- are, to succeed, learn this on their own, obviously, like you, got, like you guys have, but, um, and how you've done with your patients. But some people that just seem unable to do it on their own, I've, I've, um, well, this was my dream of having a place like this where I could facilitate them making, um, um, facilitate them able to make the, the changes and stick with them and increase the and decrease the chance of recidivism and in, increase the chance of long term success. Love it, love it. And That's the same powerful. reason I developed products because we did you know our research has been that if it's too hard for people to do and they can't find the food and they're working in the kitchen all day, you know the more they have the less support they have both support on the web having the, the, the things to make it easier for them they could buy, the ketchup with no sugar and salt in it, the salad dressing, the flavorings without, you know, that it makes it easier for them to do the program if they have products that can support them too. Yeah, no, that that's huge. And I think one, one area that you alluded to but didn't touch on deeply is really the power of, of social interaction, right? That mm-hmm. socialization and that, that combating loneliness. There's so much trauma yes. and, ha- uh, and, and ill effects from not having individuals of like mind who think like you, who can support you. And so I know that you offer 
coaching and then you have obviously this wonderful option that's there i think those are some of the 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 components of keystone habits of building upon that that social interaction that's important for people who are trying to really uh, make a change. And I've seen that struggling with some of my patients. And I know for me, it came an aha moment because, uh, you know, my system that I work, I practice in doesn't really require me to go out and have patients come in on a regular basis. But what I realized, some of the patients who maybe didn't have an active health problem, I'm their social interaction. I'm their social community that's keeping them on track. By coming in and, and like, let me tag, let me go home <laughs> and touch home real quick to make sure I'm doing the right thing because they know they will say, Doc, I knew you were going to beat me up and, and tell me what I need to do to get back on track. But I knew I needed to come in and hear it. And yeah. so I think it, it's powerful if you can't find someone in your community, join online. If you can't find a good online service, then find a good doc, a good healthcare provider who can keep you focused and engaged inside that journey towards breaking addictions. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it's all about um, giving people the options so they can have what they need to succeed because I want people who want to get healthy not to fail and not to feel they have to be sick the rest of their life. I've always said, you know, don't give up. My message is that the body is a miraculous self-healing machine if supplied optimally with the optimal environment for healing and don't underestimate the body's ability to get well. If you do if you do the right things, and then and that includes you to feel better emotionally and mentally, and feel better about your 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 life and your and your excitement about living. And so we and and one of the things we see all the time when people do get healthy and follow this approach, they always say the fog lifts off, off my brain. Hmm. I can think more clearly, and I'm much happier. So they always say they're more ha they're happier, and they're in, they're enjoying what they're eating, and they start to feel like they respect the beauty of nature, of natural foods and the magic of healing powers of the right kind of food grown in nutritious, healthy soil. And they start to realize our oneness with, the re with nature and they start to appreciate the natural world more. And it, it leads to a whole different way of seeing the world. Yes, yes, no, that's, 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 that's incredible. So you're in, you're in California part of the time. When's the last time you've gone ice skating? I'm in California all the time. Ah. Oh, yeah. you used, now, weren't you based in Jersey for a while? Yes, until my son finished high school. Well, I, ah. I had my medical practice in New Jersey for more That's than 30 years. But then when my last child finished high school, I had the retreat in California. I was coming here one week a month. But for the last two and a half years, I've been, out, I've been living here in San Diego. Oh, that's so awesome. I closed down my medical practice in New Jersey. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, so I only see people out here in California. You know, I, I travel. I don't travel as much as I used to either. Yeah. Um, but in any case, um, yeah, I still have a lot of touch. I, I, as you were mentioning, I ask, I, I answer people's questions online, and I have the member where, where people can communicate with me through um, through the internet more. So I'm actually doing less one-on-one -on -one patient care. Mm. Very nice. Very nice. So, next, what's the next book? I'm done writing books. Oh wow! I put out little booklets. You know, I put out booklets on you know. Uh, Let's say a, a, here's a 21 day diet plan to reverse diabetes. Um, you know, I'm doing some, I put out, you know, but I'm not really writing a full major book anymore. So I am kind of like easing back on my workload and have more time for a more balanced life at this point for myself. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm 68 years old, almost 69. Wow. You look amazing. Nice. You're, yes, you're, you do. You're, you're, you're a testament to, your, to what you preach in the book. So that's powerful. Thank you. Give us an example of the last physical activity that you've done that that might amaze some folks out there. Uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I like to, you know, scramble up mountains, like climb, you know, not climbing mountains, but hike, steep hiking. You know what I mean? Mm. But I play singles tennis. I, um, you know, I surf. I run on the beach. I. You know, I hike with a dog in the woods, and I, um, I do a little, I try to do a lot of different things. You know what I mean? I lift, go to the gym, and exercise with weights. But my most favorite thing, of course, is I love to ski, and I keep my body in shape for mogul skiing and hard extreme skiing. So I work mm -hmm. on, like, do box jumping. You know what I mean? I okay. jump up on a chair and back down to the floor and touch the floor again, or I run up steep hills. And so I do um, a lot of physically demanding um, things to stay in shape for more aggressive skiing, you know? Wow, that's awesome. 
Love it. Love it. Love it. And I c- couldn't leave without kind of just a, a nod to your prophetic uh, uh, book in terms of super immunity, right? With everything that we've kind of come oh, through. Yeah. <laughs> Very I, prophetic I, book. That was yeah. that's uh, that's powerful. There it looks like there were a few questions that were out there. I'll just kind of go through just a few. I think one of the ones was just really um, they were asking about your conference and if there is any way in which uh, they they say, are there scholarships available for your conference is what they said. And they and how long are the conferences for? You mentioned that 30 days at a minimum already. For well, the, the retreat in San Diego, we're open all year round. It's like we rent rooms to people to stay here for the whole month. Got right. It. So, that, you know, so but in any case, um, you know, once we if we get bigger and build more rooms, maybe in the future, we'll have some rooms available. We do have a few rooms that share a bath that are a lower price for, that are considerably lower than our regular rooms in the in the ret- retreat. So we do have some lower, um, lower price rooms that make it not as expensive as you would think for people. Um, and then there are a lot of, um, you know, people wake people can communicate with me. Um, online and watch, you know, I have like, um, you know, videos that people can watch a series of videos and they could learn, they can read and they can do on that, you know, they can do as much as they can on their own, follow diet plans. And we have recipes and I have an Ask the Doctor forum where people can communicate with other people in these forums and communicate with me in the forum as well, asking me questions to get motivated. So there's a lot of, a lot of other ways people can interact with myself and my work other than coming and spending the money or time here at the retreat. Uh, now, uh, there's a, one of our one of the viewers, Karen uh, Gaylor, talked about the fact that um, she was able to do this on her own. She did it at home. Kids didn't think she was crazy, but she says she she still eats her G bombs. Um, and um, I wanted you to talk about that a little bit because that's something that was uh, very impactful for me as well. Um, you you were, you were able to encapsulate good nutrition in that acronym very nicely. Thank you. And six words. Six letters that spell G bombs, and it represents six different foods that, in the scientific literature, have strong anti cancer and longevity promoting effects. And it's just an encouragement for people to try to eat these foods every single day if you can. So, are you eating beans every day? So, it stands for, of course, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. You know, berries can include other things that are low sugar fruits, but, but of course, we're talking about. Um, the foundation of a nutritarian diet is having a big salad at least once a day because raw vegetables have the most consistent and powerful association with the reduction of cancers of all type. So do you have a salad at least once a day, I'm asking everybody? At least one sal- nice size salad a day? Are you including red onion or scallion on top of that with half lettuce and some other greens with that lettuce, like arugula or other things mixed in? And then you're putting a dressing made of nuts and seeds instead of oil and salt? are using nuts and seeds, and we have a lot of great tasting salad dressings for that. And so our lunch is the place to start, and that lunch is usually a big salad, a bowl of vegetable bean soup with mushrooms and onions and and beans in the soup and a piece of fruit for dessert or something. So we're talking here about eating greens and beans every at least a half a cup of beans a day and and some onion or scallion, both raw and cooked, and mushrooms in your food. Uh, And uh, and then, of course, um, fruit and and berries and seeds like flax seeds, chia seeds, sesame seeds, hemp seeds, which are so nutritious because people don't know the powerful effects of seeds at preventing at lowering blood pressure and lowering cholesterol, but of course on preventing cancer, especially hormonally sensitive cancers like prostate and breast cancer. And so are you having some flax seeds or chia seeds every day? In your, in- Re- repeat that about the, um, the hormonal um, cancers. I want to make sure you say that again. I think that's a, that's a big issue that we've seen on the show. Just repeat that for me, please. Yeah, right. That people don't, some of people don't recognize the powerful effect that these seeds have on preventing hormonally sensitive cancers like breast and prostate cancer. Because, for example, a study tracked women who had breast cancer for 10 years and the risk of dying over that 10 year period was 71, reduced the risk of mortality 71%, just Mm. like those that had some lignans from seeds in their diet compared to none. That's after they already had cancer. It's ever so more effective if you do these things before you get a cancer diagnosis, but and they only had a, a tiny bit of a third of a milligram of lignin, and they even not even the right dose. I'm mm-hmm. saying these that don't underestimate the power of these foods individually to impact disease and also the power of these foods synergistically when you include a dietary portfolio that includes all these things, including a big salad, bowl of vegetable bean soup the wok vegetable dishes with the onions and mushrooms in it and the green vegetables cooked. And when you do all these things together in your whole dietary portfolio, 
there's a tremendous um, impact on your life. Yes. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. This has been great. This has been great. I, I have to say that you are definitely live fit the bill. You are a great example. It's a powerful message that's there. And once again, I, I'm very appreciative of you personally for all the yes. things that you've done for laying the foundation like this. And I think our job is to kind of take that baton and keep car uh, carrying it forward, right? To, to reach other people as many as possible and, and with the same level of passion and philanthropic uh, spirit as what you've done. So thank you for all that you've done. Frank, thank, thank you, you so much. And that's such, so dear to my heart that, you, that you're saying this and feeling my work is continuing through you as I get older. That's such a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. Thanks. Absolutely. We appreciate Absolutely. You. So, so we know people can find you at drferman.com. They can email you. They can join and become members. They can go yep. down and see you in person, right? And spend right. a month with you. And I think one of these days we're going to have to actually come out there. Maybe we can do a show and walk the grounds uh, out that way. See, I'm trying oh, to yeah. get in uh, some, <laughs> get in there, get in there. Listen, I, I I was with Dr. Furman at a conference and had the pleasure of speaking. I, I opened the show for him. He was he was following afterwards. You know, I was an mm -hmm. open liner, and um, he brought some fruit that was just so incredible, so incredible. And so, if I could just have the opportunity to get fruit like that again, it will be worth the drive and yeah. Eric for you the flight out there. I'm looking forward to you guys coming to visit. Some we, yes. once I get it'd be nice when the place is finished next year. Do you all come down and stay with me for a little bit? We'd love that. Love to, love to, love to. All right. Well, listen. Thank you again for spending time. We thank those of you out there who've joined us this Friday evening for spending time. Look forward to seeing you again. We'll be back in the next several weeks. We are back at, we, from a brief hiatus. We're back for the remainder of the year and heading into 2023. So thank you. Be well. Stay well. And see you soon.